of the Transportation Accessibility Advisory Committee started. Um, I'm going to do roll call uh, down the list of folks who I think are here based on um, who is who is in the WebEx meeting. Um, and if I miss you, please, by all means, let me know that you're here so we can mark you as attended. All right, so Claudia. Daryl. Here. Thank you, Eric. Uh, here. Trevor. Here. Ken. Here. Awesome, Heidi. Here. Richard. Here. Jeff. Here. Sam. Here. And John. I see you just jumped on, John. Just making sure that you are unmuted and are here. I think that's everybody, all the tech members. Nope, that are Diane Graham Rail. Did I not say Diane? I didn't I did hear not. you if you did, sorry. I did not say your name. I'm looking at your face, but I did not say your name. You um, also didn't call Carrie Sheldon 0878. Carrie, perfect. Thank you, Carrie. We got a good crowd today. This is awesome. All right. And myself, I am here too. Did I not call anybody else? Patsy Murphy. All right. Keep them coming. Team, anybody else? I'm John Clark. John Clark. Perfect. Thank you. Here we go. Let's roll them all up. 14 people. Wow. That's almost full attendance, y'all. All right. I hope everybody's having a good summer. Let's There's see. 25 participants on, David. Yes. Yeah, yeah. 14 um, um, tech okay. members. Yeah. That's what I was going to ask you. Is there that many other people? Okay. We get a lot of a lot of support from uh from Met Council staff, Metro Transit staff. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's well, always they, nice to have them. Oh, yes. definitely. All right, let's get rolling. Um I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda, um, unless anybody has any changes to it. Motion to approve the agenda, Jeff Dane. All right, thanks, Jeff. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. All right, I'll go down the list. Just a quick yes, I, or however you want to give me an affirmative um, is fine. Claudia? And I can't see thumbs up if you're putting thumbs up. Okay, there we go. Sorry, I wasn't looking up. Daryl? Yes. yes. Eric? Yes. Trevor? Yes. Ken? Yes. Heidi? Yes. Richard? Yes. Jeff? Yes. Sam? Yes. John? Yes. Diane? Yes. Did you give a thumbs up? Sorry, I was not looking up. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Gary? <clears throat> Yes. Yeah. And Patsy. Yes. Thank you all very much. All right. Approved. The agenda is approved. And I would entertain a motion to approve the minutes from June, <coughs> um, two months ago, our TAC meeting. Motion to approve minutes. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Awesome. Thank you, the three of you. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh yes, and I say uh, yes. Who, to as well. who moved to approve the minutes? Uh, Diane, and then I think Patsy seconded it with a uh, with support from Daryl and one other person. <laughs> Sam. Sam. I would gave it to Sam. I think Sam said it first. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, I'll do roll call and give me a yes or no, Claudia.
Daryl? Yes. Eric? Yes. Trevor? <clears throat> Sorry. Ken? Yes. Heidi? Yes. Richard? Yes. Jeff? Yes. Sam? Yes. John? <laughs> Diane? Yes. Carrie? Yes. And Patsy? Yes. Awesome. Cool. Let's dive right into the ADA transition plan update. Guthrie, um, who is the ADA in Title uh, VI Administrator um, at the Metropolitan Council, has given us um, a few updates on this so far. It's been what maybe about six months, I think. Um, but the the yeah the the Metropolitan Council Metro Transit is putting putting together a comprehensive uh, ADA transition plan. Essentially, a transition plan um, is is a guide for any entity to um, remove all the barriers that, that entity may have, whether it's policy, whether it's programmatic, whether it's um, physical barriers, digital accessibility barriers. Um, but Guthrie is going to give us an update on on how the transition plan is coming along. Um, so take it away, Guthrie. Hey, everybody. Hopefully you can see me and hear me. So this is uh, Guthrie Bayard Council's ADA and Title VI Administrator. Uh, present as a white male, he, him, pronouns. Uh, and I'm uh, wearing short uh, dark brown hair and a short beard and uh, a dark gray shirt and a um, gray sweater over that. I'm in my office at the Metro Transit headquarters here. Um, Jason, are you intending to uh, pull up the, the slides or did you want me to share my screen? I don't know what everybody's looking at here. Okay. No, we see multiple screens. We don't see the actual slideshow. That's okay. So as uh, as Jason pulls up the the slides here, um, as uh, Chair Fenley had mentioned, so you know the the council has uh, thanks Jason. So the council has embarked on uh, a multi year effort to ensure that we're in compliance with the ADA under Title II of the uh, Americans with Disabilities Act, and that started with a self evaluation. Uh, primarily of our physical facilities, um, but it has expanded beyond that and we're doing quite a bit around digital accessibility uh, and, um, and in other areas where we're incorporating universal design principles. And so I wanna be able to provide you all with an update on where we're at with all of that work. Uh, so not just strictly what's in the transition plan, but a lot of the other work that we're doing. Um, and to do this at least on an annual basis, if not more, to provide you with um, with the latest. So, um, so background on, on the, the self-evaluation. So the second half of 2019, we brought in JQP Incorporated, which is a local uh, accessibility specialist vendor. Uh, they are what's uh, considered a uh, Metropolitan Council underutilized business. Uh, it's a small local uh, women owned business. And so they went to uh, over 140 facilities and provided us with reports on all of those facilities. So not only Metro Transit, but also environmental uh, services facilities. So the wastewater treatment plants. Um, and that work resulted in uh, that ADA transition plan, which is up on our ADA and accessibility website, and that is updated on an annual basis. So it was updated earlier this year uh, with the work that occurred last year, as well as the work that is occurring this year, uh, and will be again uh, updated on an annual basis uh, to reflect uh, work that has been done and work that is planned to be done. 
Next slide, Jason. So just to recap, there was some community engagement uh, uh, when we uh, undertook the ADA self-evaluation. So we held a couple of listening sessions in the community. Uh, we had a formal public comment period and uh, conducted a survey both for staff and community. And we got a ton of feedback um, that uh, primarily focused on um, uh, information that was available on our website and making sure that it was digitally accessible um, but also around public transit and ensuring that things like priority seating was available which i know is there's a subgroup here with uh with tech that's working on that um, but also things like you know uh ensuring that our uh, the parks that we have uh, purview over and that we're supporting are um, accessible both physically and digitally and things like that. And so we got a lot of good feedback that was able to uh, work with some of our different divisions on not just related to transportation. Next slide, Jason. So uh, as I mentioned, each report received a, uh, a, or excuse me, each facility received a report and uh, that report with the ADA self-evaluation um, essentially listed all of the uh, barriers, uh, both under the ADA design standards, but also under Minnesota accessibility code were applicable. And those barriers were listed on kind of a one to four uh, prioritization level or uh, significance level. So uh, one being the most significant uh, and four being the least significant. And we had a, over 3000 barriers that were identified and priority three was the most common severity level. And I should say of those 3000 barriers, I believe one percent, possibly 2% were priority one. So it was good that there weren't significant um, uh, barriers for the public to be able to access our programs and services. And I should say with priority one, essentially that means that it's a significant barrier for somebody to be able to access a program or service, but it's also something that's easy to modify or fairly inexpensive. And so those priority ones that did come up, uh, those were uh, addressed more quickly uh, or are in the process of being uh, addressed. So for instance, with environmental services, they have public tours uh, and there were some inaccessible uh, routes with those public tours that are being addressed. But as you all know, with COVID, we're not offering those public tours uh, in person right now. So it's something that'll uh, be worked on as we go forward. And then uh, those reports help to prioritize on an annual basis the work that Metro Transit does, that Environmental Services does, uh, and the other divisions do when they carry out their work. So next slide. A few examples of kind of the, the breadth of the, the findings here. So there's two photos on this slide. There's a photo on the left and that's at the Maplewood Mall Transit Center. Uh, and that's just showing a trash receptacle that is essentially in the way of the accessible route to the uh, interior uh, of that building. And it's essentially blocking access to uh, the push uh, button uh, to open up an automatic door. So that's an example of where it's, you know, public facilities just making sure that they are um, properly placing receptacles so that it's not impeding on uh, one's ability to be able to access uh, the facility. And then the photo on the right is at the 38th Street light rail station along the blue line. And this is a little more complex because there's a receptacle that is in the way of the accessible route coming off of the uh, southbound train. Um, but there's also a, a shelter that has uh, built in heat uh, that is um, essentially too close to the curb cut. And so there is a significant cross slope there uh, where somebody coming in to trying to get into the, the shelter there would uh, uh, would hit that significant cross slope. So that's a bit harder to fix um, and a bit more of a repair. Uh, but again, just kind of showing you the breadth of the work that, uh, that lies ahead. So next slide, please. 
So as you all know, with COVID, a lot of the physical work that uh, was planned for, for last year was, was stymied a bit. And so we're picking up on that work this year. Um, but there was work that occurred in 2019, in some cases uh, prior uh, to the ADA self-evaluation occurring, and then uh, work that did occur uh, in 2020. And so I've just listed a few of those here. So there was some restriping of some of our um, parking lots to make those uh, in compliant with, uh, compliance with the ADA. Uh, and then there were uh, numerous truncated domes that were replaced along the blue line uh, that had kind of aged out. And then uh, several, uh, as you all know, the five by eight ADA pads were replaced at various bus stops and um, and there'll be a presentation on the, the Better Bus Stops program that will talk a bit more about uh, uh, installing those pads um, going forward. And then last year, there, uh, the papers were replaced at the Robbinsdale Transit Center. Uh, there were designs created for the first floor bathroom at the, uh, essentially at the Metro Transit headquarters at the Haywood facility where there's a, um, uh, where we have the new Metro Transit Police Department building and there's a chambers there and across from the chambers, there's a, a bathroom there and that is uh, being remodeled to be fully accessible. Uh, and then uh, the Transit Control Center, that parking lot known as the Green Lot, there was an accessible route that was installed there to uh, connect uh, another parking lot as well as to connect the, um, the Haywood Bus Garage. And then um, kind of focus more on digital accessibility. Uh, we uh, had a split contract or have a split contract with WECO as well as Accessible 360 and WECO uh, has done quite a bit for us to audit our uh, websites for digital accessibility under WCAG 2.0 level 2A standards. And so I listed that here. They conducted a, a full audit of the Metro Transit uh, website last year. Next slide. So uh, this slide has a couple of photos uh, of some of the completed work that I mentioned. So the photo on the left is of the Robbinsdale Paver uh, project and the photo on the right is of the uh, Better Bus Routes program on uh, Route 63 that shows a recently installed ADA uh, pad at one of the bus stops. Next slide, please. So work this year, so the, I just listed here some of the work that um, in some cases has already occurred and, and in other cases is is uh, occurring now or, or will occur this year. And so that first floor bathroom, as I mentioned, that is being completed right now at the uh, Haywood facility uh, and a few other um, projects that are uh, going on right now. And so the Nicolet uh, garage, the maintenance area is being renovated. And these are all based on the, uh, the facility reports that we received. The Sunray Transit Center, there's gonna be new pedestrian ramps placed there. Uh, as uh, you all know, the Mall of America, the pedestrian crossing has been completed uh, there. So there was uh, essentially a, um, they grinded a, a tactile strip along the outside of that angled crosswalk um, to aid those who are blind or of low vision as the kind of curb cut dumps you out away from that crosswalk. So this is to help align you and orient you to that crosswalk. And that was uh, completed here recently. Uh, additionally, there'll be work completed at Northtown Transit Center sometime soon. It looks like the go-ahead has been given to do some construction there. Uh, and then kind of outside the JQP uh, reports, uh, 6th and Minnesota Street, the bus stop uh, sidewalk area there is going to be uh, renovated and, and improved. So including the curb cuts there and the, and the bus stop uh, itself. And then there's uh, some tactile replacements occurring at the Nicollet station uh, on the blue line, blue and green line, I should say. Next slide. So kind of um, in some cases here going beyond physical uh, ADA compliance and physical accessibility, I wanted to just provide you all with a list of some of the broader work that we're doing within Metro Transit. So there's a new uh, mobile app uh, that'll be in place. Token is the vendor, and uh, we work to ensure that that is going to be digitally accessible. Ken Rogers was in on that technical advisory group to provide some input uh, on that uh, and selecting the vendor for that app. Um, there's going to be some uh, swapping out of some of the ticket vending machines uh, to ensure that on the 
uh, blue line that we have an accessible vending machine at each uh, stop. So uh, the JQP finding showed that uh, the vending machines were along the blue line. Two, the highest operating part was two inches too high. So we want to make sure that we have an accessible vending machine at each one of those stops. And so that's going to be kind of a multi-year uh, effort, but underway here, uh, I believe no later than this fall that they'll start making those um, those changes. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, the the website was uh, recently uh, audited, and so uh, certain folks are going through that and making sure that the Metro Transit website is uh, in compliance uh, with digital accessibility standards. And as kind of new projects are underway, as as work is done to kind of refine um, uh, the the information on the Metro Transit website, that will continually work to make sure that it's digitally accessible, and in some cases. Uh, consult with WECO uh, on any sort of proposed changes. Uh, as uh, some of you may know, the IRA third-party wayfinding app is live now. That's a six-month pilot that started in June. Um, so if you, you haven't used it or you, you have, um, uh, we would appreciate any sort of feedback that you may have on that, and that's something that we're really excited to see further roll out and 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 see you know used with the uh, state fair uh, upcoming. And so, uh, any feedback you may have on that, and and any promotion that you could uh, uh, provide would be would be great as that as we're moving forward there. And so that's going to be a free service for those who use it for uh, Metro Transit. Um, any sort of metro transit services so any of your um any of your uh, uh you know, the bus is that you're using things like that um you can use ira um within within the metro transit service area um and then I mentioned the beacon pilot here. So this is really something that'll get going later this year. So really the idea is to um, develop uh, and uh, install beacons at two uh, locations. Uh, so one being University in Raymond and the other at University in Snelling. Uh, so the idea here is to kind of evaluate the beacon technology uh, and to see if it really benefits those who are blind and low vision um, to determine if it really supports them in, in um, their wayfinding of kind of multimodal transportation support. Uh, and so there'll be uh, a series of um, uh, kind of evaluation components to that and a look at maintenance and what it might require to, to keep in place. Uh, and then uh, next year, uh, there'll be a final report and evaluation later in the year. And kind of expanding on that, there's been a lot uh, of work that transit information has done around accessible wayfinding signage. And so also later this year, uh, there'll be installation of some uh, improved wayfinding signage at Mall of America. I know many uh, know that it can be hard to navigate Mall of America Transit Station. Uh, and so they'll kind of evaluate the experience uh, from customers once that's in place. And then Early next year, uh, a similar uh, process will be undertaken at the West Bank station. Um, and then, uh, as some of you, uh, as some of you, uh, some of you also know, uh, transit information and marketing uh, have has undertaken uh, a series of uh, improvements to print and digital materials. And there's been a subgroup working on some of that, including some folks from TAC. Uh, and so that effort is underway uh, and continues, uh, and will continue uh, to the uh, end of the year. And then I uh, won't speak too much on this as this is a, a, the, the topic of the presentation after this, but uh, as I mentioned, Better Bus Stops is a, a program that in part is looking to improve the accessibility of our uh, bus stops in, in our uh, metro area. And they have a five-year plan to upgrade shelters and add ADA pads, which they'll explain after this presentation. And it also includes uh, a new uh, regular route uh, bus stop design guide uh, that will be gone through uh, and a ADA checklist uh, to support staff in ensuring that um, we've got an inventory of, of our uh, ADA bus stops, but also that we're uh, improving uh, bus stop accessibility based on guidelines. So next slide, please. So um, 
Uh, kind of more broadly, I wanted to just share a few updates. So as you all know, we had the ADA self-evaluation in 2019. Uh, there was a, that, as I mentioned, that split contract for digital accessibility. One was with Accessible 360 that actually did a series of conversations with staff to kind of understand where are we at with digital accessibility uh, across the organization. So uh, where do we implement digital accessibility training? Uh, what are our digital or what do our document templates look like across the council? Where can they be accessed? How accessible are those templates? Um, and uh, things of that nature to kind of get at more of a well-rounded digital accessibility program uh, at the council. Uh, and in last year, we, we fully implemented that ADA transition plan. As I mentioned, that'll be updated on an annual basis. We updated our accessibility policy to provide more guidance and clarity, specifically around the um, the state standard on accessibility and formally adopting the WCAG 2.0 level 2A standards. Uh, we conducted a, a very large um, uh, pilot around the Minnesota IT Services Accessible Word document uh, training, and that is now a requirement for all staff so that we have baseline training on document accessibility, uh, especially since a lot of our documents end up making their way under our websites or presented uh, to councils and committees. It's extremely important that every document uh, is, uh, is accessible uh, before it goes live. And then there's ongoing ADA uh, and Minnesota building code uh, training that is occurring. Uh, we had a couple of sessions with Metro Transit last year and ongoing work with environmental services this year and in some cases expanding uh, to include universal design principles and that's being led by JQP as kind of a follow-up to the reports that they provided us. So really ensuring that, hey, you now know what is out of compliance, but do you know how to fix uh, those issues, but you know, more importantly, too, do you know how to be proactive so that these issues don't occur with new construction and, and renovation going forward? And then an ongoing review of our policies and procedures to make sure that there's not discriminatory language. Uh, and that's kind of part of a broader equity effort that we're undertaking to uh, make sure that our policies and procedures, both for staff uh, and for the public, are, are equitable. So, next slide. All right, um, so uh, kind of a, a few uh, other items that are occurring this year, a few other things that we're working on. So we have drafted an accessible video and an accessible IT services procedure. And so those procedures uh, are uh, going through uh, the process uh, of refinement and eventual adoption by the, uh, by the council. Um, and we're working to uh, continually improve uh, our video accessibility efforts uh, and uh, with any sort of remodeled or, or newly installed uh, larger public meeting uh, rooms, we're ensuring that there's hearing loops that are installed there. Um, we're ensuring that our social media practices are meeting, are, are, uh, meeting accessibility uh, standards uh, and um, Kind of a complex uh, process, but making sure that map accessibility is front and center and that we are uh, connecting staff with community of practice groups across the state to kind of leverage the state uh, experiences around uh, map accessibility and adopting those practices here at the council, uh, since we do create quite a bit uh, of quite a few maps here for um, for community use. Next slide, please. And that is all. I appreciate uh, you all uh, taking the time to listen, and I'm uh, open to, to questions here. I believe we've got some time for questions. David, can I speak now? This is Heidi. Yes, yes, Heidi. Thank you. Thank you, Guthrie. Um, yeah, take it away, Heidi, and then we'll go around and let other tech members uh, ask questions. Well, the first thing is this um, meeting we're having today. I, I've been looking at the um, thing that helps read, you know, spell it out, you know, on the screen. It, it didn't say everything that Guthrie said correctly. So that's something we have to look at, you know. So our meetings aren't ADA, aren't up to, you know, it's malfunctioning some of the words that he said. And it screwed up ADA many times. And then the 
other things I want to bring up is I had a bus driver tell me this, and he said, they're not going to listen to me, but if I can tell you, because I said I was on the, the transportation thing, in West St. Paul is a 68C that goes halfway down R Robert Street and then turns. There's a bus stop that isn't ADA, and he was telling me how it should be ADA and be better for the disabled. So I was really impressed. So there are bus drivers that care about us, it's just how do we make it ADA? And then the other thing um, we still need to work on is where we put the bus schedules because it's not following any ADA or any kind of help for people with disabilities because I still see it all over the Twin Cities. They're placing them when they remodel in really dumb places. So all people with different kinds of disabilities wouldn't be able to all access the um, schedules of the buses at the bus shelter. And I don't understand the practice of this one bus stop I saw coming back on the 54 bus from the Mall of America, downtown St. Paul, close to the Green Line, where one side of the shelter is has kind of like a step, you have to step up into it, and then the other part is low, so the wheelchair can go in. But does anybody know about our winters? That snow is going to pile inside the side that, you know. This is David. Thank you, Heidi. Are, were you finished? You sort of just cut off there. As I try to drink some water. So yes, just a reminder um, to TAC members, if, if you need any sort of accommodation for these meetings, Please let us know if, whether that's ASL uh, interpretation, cart services, or any other <laughs> disability-related accommodation. Yeah, and and Heidi, this is Guthrie. I will follow up with you specifically just to learn a bit more about some of the comments that you made, just so I can better understand and then work with those who might be able to make some of those uh, changes. Uh, Mr. Thank Chair, you. I have. Um, few questions. Go ahead, Eric. Uh, I was just wondering if I could get some clarification on the priority level that you discussed. Um, you had mentioned of the 3,000 or over 3,000 barriers, um, one to 2% were at this priority one, which was of the highest significance, but they were cheap and kind of easy to fix or I should say inexpensive, which just intuitively I would think something that has a higher significance might be a little more difficult or more expensive and timely. Um, so just a little clarification on how that works, especially how significant or priority levels play into actually removing the barrier. Is it a scheme where you go for the highest significance, then go to two, go to one, two, three, then four? Um, and then kind of my last question would be, what looking at what was, accomplished in the last couple of years as far as barrier removals, what would be the trend line for completing or at least removing a majority of the 3,000? So if 50 are being removed a year, that leaves us at about 60 years out. We're actually um, eliminating all barriers, so I didn't know how we're looking as far as progress. Chair and uh, council men, uh, members, um, so th thank you for that. Uh, and as far as the clarification goes on the priority one, so, you know, these priorities um, were established kind of by JQP and we kind of have our own way of prioritizing based on um, where these facilities fall in line with capital improvement projects, uh, kind of the scope of those projects, um, the amount of personnel that are available uh, to take some of this work on. Uh, and so that makes it hard since it's kind of it's uh, fluid in some cases and certainly COVID makes it a lot harder to kind of um, move forward in, a, in an established timeline that we have. But with priority one, the again, the idea is that it's, uh, it, there are issues for upgrade really of the highest priority. And so it's a more of a barrier for participation in a program or an activity, yet it's easy to modify or it's inexpensive. Like it might just be a, uh, a like in the case of the environmental services and the public tour route, it's the case of just 
uh, providing an alternate route or changing the route slightly so it avoids a series of stairs uh, that it doesn't require a, a lot of work or effort to to change and so that's how jqp had identified it that that would be a priority one that you look at uh, those and then as far as kind of how metro hey, Godfrey, i'm back on we had electricity glitch did i get to finish or did i get cut off I, Heidi, I think you got cut off, but I will. Okay, come, sorry. It's okay. I will come back around to you so you can finish your comments, okay? Yeah, because we had a glitch and so the Wi Fi went dead for a second. Yes, I, yeah, I noticed that you cut off, so I, I, I asked you um, if you had finished yet, but uh, well, I'll come back around to you. I have a couple other questions that I'll Thank come you. back around to you, okay, Heidi? Yeah, and, and just. Thank uh, you. So just to kind of um, to, to finish here. Um, what I would say is that, you know, as far as a percentage, I think that we're less focused on the percentage or we're more focused on uh, when uh, projects are occurring that we are looking at those reports and that we're making as many of the fixes as possible. I would say since priority three has come up as the most, uh, as the most common level, we are looking at priority twos and priority threes because most of those priority ones were environmental services. Uh, and so we're looking at a lot of those fixes. So oftentimes they're like the, the the height of operable parts and things like that and and obstructions where they just need to be relocated and so now you're talking about packaging uh projects where it's like parking signage and striping versus like public maintenance with um, location of objects and things like that. And so you try to package those out. And so that's an ongoing effort um, and one that we're, uh, you know, doing on an annual basis. And I should just say that, you know, as, the sooner we can get a lot of these barriers uh, completed and, and fixed, uh, the better. Uh, but there's not a, an end date. Um, because I don't think that that really serves us well to just have an end date, um, but it's something where it's it's continually being prioritized and, and thankfully folks understand that we need to make sure that ADA improvements are made whenever work is being done uh, at any of these facilities. And in some cases, that that's the primary focus is that we just go in and we make these ADA improvements and that we're uh, ensuring that there's funding available to be able to do that on an annual basis. Well, and I'd just like to follow up real quick. I, I can understand not wanting to put an end date on, um, you know, meeting this goal of we're going to remove all 3,000 barriers because barriers could actually be introduced later, which are discovered. But I would recommend that there is some type of tracking regarding the barriers and, and looking or forecasting out how long it will take because with the approaches, we're going to, you know, incorporate these into CIP projects as best we can. But if it's found that it won't happen for 100 years, that might push people who write the checks to maybe put a, a standalone uh, CIP item or some kind of budgetary um, framework to try to remove as many barriers as possible, but more on standalone projects, um, therefore giving it a little more priority. So I, I guess I, it would be just as a recommendation to maybe try to try to track that and get get a handle on um, you know how how much progress is being made towards the, the plan. Um, and removing the barriers. Yep, thank you for that feedback, I appreciate it. Yep, it's ongoing conversations with Metro Transit and, uh, um, you know, as you know, it's it's complex, but it's certainly one where, you know, it's well well taken and, and I think that that makes, makes a lot of sense to continually work towards that. Carrie, you have your hand up? Yes, thank you. Um, just a couple of questions um for for you guthrie on slide number eight uh more 2021 metro transit work uh you mentioned these pilot programs there's two of them and can you uh go over them just one, one more time because i think i missed that yeah i can do that uh thank you uh carrie um so the first one is the ira um pilot so that's a six-month pilot that started in june so it'll run until the end of the year and that is a third-party uh navigation or wayfinding app 
uh, that you can find on your smartphone uh, and uh, you can use it for free while you are utilizing Metro Transit. So it's to support you in taking Metro Transit and certainly in areas where it could be complex urban environments and there's uh, a, uh, a navigator who is trained to support you in uh, navigating your surroundings to get you where you need to go. Uh, and so we're um, monitoring the progress of that pilot to see if it's successful enough to incorporate into our broader transit information um, and wayfinding uh, kind of suite of resources. And then the other one is that beacon, that Bluetooth beacon uh, pilot. So that is one that hasn't started yet, but they'll essentially there'll be content and uh, developed here later this year in the in the last quarter and the installation of these beacons will be uh, made available uh, next year at two different locations along uh, the green line. Uh, and university, uh, and then they'll be evaluated for their success throughout the year with a report on uh, on their uh, and findings um, of that pilot at the end of the year. Okay, thank you. Yep. Andy Strezik, did I see that you had your hand up? Yeah, thank you, Chair and members. I just wanted to point out that Metro Mobility um, has been able to, to kind of piggyback on a couple of things um, uh, that Metro Transit had uh, initiated. Uh, one with the contract uh, with WECO, we were able to have them do a comprehensive review of the online trip booking uh, site for Metro Mobility as we were rolling that out. So we were uh, pleased with their expertise and, and were able to make some substantial <laughs> changes there with regard to accessibility. And then also, we are currently working with Metro Transit staff uh, and our, our contractors to see whether or not uh, there might be some use with the IRA project uh, to have uh, some of our pickup and drop off locations uh, within complex facilities take if there's anything that's sufficiently static um, so that it would be a good fit there. You know, the Mall of America, for example, comes to mind where there's uh, uh, you know, specific metro mobility pick and drop location within a complex facility that is where the bus always goes and it's unlikely to change. So we're looking at that as well. Thank you, Andy. Uh, we'll go to Daryl and then Patsy. Uh, Godfrey, I just wanted to, I just wanted to say I, I, I'm, I'm impressed in your short time that you've been with the council. They've been able to uh, do some of the self-evaluation and now move into implementation of some of those things. I'm really excited about the digital, the the digital stuff that we're putting forward in Metro Transit and uh, and our facilities and our online presence. I'm totally impressed by all that. As as the couple trips that I taken before COVID with Metro Transit and some staff, um, the digital presence and the signage and all the accessible features, they they were looking at these things probably five to 10 years ago. And the fact that we're looking at them now, some of those places I have been using like QR codes and digital presence for the last probably seven years. And the fact that we're doing it now is, is I mean, I'm excited about it because we don't have to go through the hiccups and the bugs that they had to work out when they implemented their, their uh, programs. So we don't have to fight with that. Um, but more importantly, I do think that the general public is starting to be more familiar with it and more comfortable with its use and the the reason we need those accessible features and I'm I'm impressed every day when I hear things come out of out of your office and out of the staff and even people that are not thinking about this on a regular basis they're saying you know because of what we heard over here we're now looking at more accessible features so thank you 
Thanks for that feedback. Take it away, Patsy. I was questioning on page nine under your more 2021 Metro Transit work, new mobile app. What mm -hmm. app are we referring to? And is this something that is going to be just for doing the uh, buses or is this also going to be working for the Metro mobility, which is what I use. I am not able to use the buses. Yeah, thank you for that, Patsy. So uh, this is the new Metro Transit app, so it'll replace the one that is currently uh, available right now. Um, and I don't have a hard timeline for you on when that will be in place, but Token is working on it. They're the vendor uh, that will be uh, putting together that, that app. And I list that because like I said, we wanted to make sure that that was one that was digitally accessible uh, and screen reader accessible. And, and Ken provided some input on that uh, earlier this year. And so um, I'm sure that there'll be more about that. In fact, you know, I don't mean to speak too much for the next agenda, but if I understand correctly, there'll be a presentation on the on the app um, during the September meeting. The other question that I had for you, Guthrie, was um, I know there was the pilot program with uh, Dakota County covering the lift, and I was wondering if that was something that was going to be happening here in Hennepin County? And if so, how soon? Thanks for that question, Patsy. Andy, I wonder if you have any information on that. I know that that mobility, there was, um, wasn't there a, a contract in place or there was a pilot looking at that with Lyft? Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, uh, Chair, members of the committee, uh, we are in the process of trying to execute uh, a contract with Lyft uh, that is not yet a done deal. Uh, I've run into some uh, uh, confusion about the interpretation of the scope of work uh, that has made that a little bit more challenging and, and less of an eventuality than we would have hoped at this point, but we're working on it and we do hope to have some sort of TMC style um, contract. We, we are more imminently uh, in, I think, hopefully final testing phases um, with our current taxi provider um, uh, to launch an app-based platform very similar to those used by TMCs uh, that we have a number of testers involved in. And I know Ken and I think Sam um, both from this committee are, are involved in, in the testing of that. Um, but uh, uh, as for the contract with, with Lyft itself, we're, we're still working out some things. Thank you. Thank you, Andy, and thank you, Guthrie. And thank you all for the good questions. Um, we're a little bit over on the agenda, which is fine, but <clears throat> um, I wanted to, to, to uh, since Heidi got cut off, just repeat what was said and then give Heidi another chance to to finish some of her questions. But so um, what I said after after you got cut off, Heidi, was uh, a reminder to TAC members that if you need um, accommodations, whether it's ASL interpretation or whether it's a, a cart services that's captioning, to please let um, Allison um, and myself know and we're, we're happy to to make sure that any accommodations you need for these meetings are met. Um, and then also Guthrie had said that uh, he would, and I'm guessing you did not hear any of this given that you got cut off. Um, Guthrie said that he would gladly follow up with you about specific uh, um, recommendations or instances that you've bumped into barriers that, that you think um, might have a place in the transition plan. So definitely that for the more specific um, um, instances, that's better to handle offline rather than in these meetings. Um, and, and I think Guthrie might be able to provide us with, uh, with 
either a phone number or an email address where we can send um, 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 instances of, of, of uh, access barriers that exist in, in Metro Transit system. So that's what you missed from from the response to your to your question, Heidi. Did you want to say one more thing before we move to the next agenda item? No, I was just impressed when the bus driver brought it up that one of the bus stops were not ADA. And if he's seen it, then he's looking out for our best interest. But he said he knows his voice won't get heard. So he's hoping that people like me will take it back. And so if that's we can get together with me to talk about it. And we still need to work on those signatures at certain bus stops, you know, because they're not putting them in the right spots so everybody can access it correctly. And then just think about how we rebuild a new shelter, because the one I was trying to talk about when I got cut off is before we um, see the green line, and I was on the 54, and I never seen anything like that in all the years I rode a um, bus. And so it's a new shelter in a very weird way. So I would like to talk to Guthrie and the group about it and see if we can stop that kind of behavior. It's just very inappropriate. And because they don't know about whoever thought of this, they didn't think about our winters, they didn't think about disabilities, they didn't think about people standing there. So I just wanted to bring that up. So thanks for letting me speak again, Gus, all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi. Um, and this shouldn't be an issue for me, but I just got a message from my computer that it's going to force me to restart in 90 minutes. We should be done with the meeting by then. But I just wanted to let you all know that if you lose me before this meeting's over, uh, that's why, and I'm sure Daryl will gladly take over while I try to call in on my phone. Um, but it shouldn't happen, but I just want to give you a heads up. All right, so gotta love the forced restarts that that Microsoft does to you when you're in the middle of a workday. Um, um, moving on to better bus stops, the five-year work program and, and regular uh, route bus stop design guide. Uh, we have Barry Farrington and I'm guessing it's Sonia um, um, who will be presenting. Uh, take it away. I'll give you your full allotted time. I won't stop you at 1.50. Um, if we need to go over a few minutes, that is fine. So Barry and Sonia, please uh, proceed. Thank you. Um... I'm Barry, and uh, as said, well, I'm here with Sonia. We work in the Engineering and Facilities Department at Metro Transit, and thanks for having us today. Um, I use she, her pronouns, and today I am working at home. Our, our purpose today is to give you the details, a little more details about the work Metro Transit is doing to improve bus stop accessibility. So that's very much part of what Guthrie mentioned as well. First, I'm going to highlight the Better Bus Stops five-year five program, and then Sonia will give you an overview of some key sections from a new design guide that we have for bus stops. Um, and we're sharing this information with you today because we'd like to hear about your experiences with bus stop accessibility, and if there's topics that you'd like to um, discuss in further detail at a future time too. Jason, thanks for showing the slides. Can we go to slide two? Thanks. Um, so Better Bus Stops is about improving the transit customer experience at the bus stop, and that's their transit information, accessible boarding areas, pedestrian connections, and at our higher ridership bus stops, the shelters, light and heat that come with those shelters. Um, so we began this um, program as, um, as a focus on equity and access to opportunity. Last year, we achieved goals to add 150 shelters and improve 75 existing shelters um, in neighborhoods where the majority of residents are people of color and experiencing lower incomes. Uh, so shelter light and heat are now available at similar or higher rates within this equity focus area compared to the rest of our service area. So with those original goals met, we've been working to set new goals through a five-year plan. Next slide. Um, so here are the five-year goals that people of color continue to have equitable access to shelters, light, and heat. And then we have three broad goals about accessibility. Um, first, that all bus stops with shelters have accessible boarding areas, pedestrian access, and clear spaces. Metro Transit places shelters at stops where many people are boarding the bus 
and we want to further focus on these steps to correct accessibility barriers where they exist. The next goal is that the availability of accessible uh, transit stops increases. Now, this sounds like a basic goal, um, but it's really to help us focus on measurement. Um, Eric um, earlier had comments about tracking your progress, and, and that's something we really want to do better when it comes to accessible bus stops. We have 12,000 bus stops, and we need to set up systems that show how we're doing, what's the work that's yet to be needed. Um, finally, we have a goal that construction projects that touch bus stops will result in accessible bus stops, and that's construction projects by Metro Transit, by roadway authorities, and um, development. They should also result in accessible transit stops. Um, construction projects that have pedestrian facilities within that project scope, they should not leave bus stops um, in place that are, that are inaccessible. So this requires uh, Metro Transit to work closely with cities and development partners. It's um, outside of our control in terms of others' projects, but we want to influence our partners in their design and construction of bus stops. That's something Sonia will talk more about. Next slide. We now have a checklist that Metro Transit staff can use to inventory the physical features that determine a bus stop's accessibility. And this will help us have better data about um, what we have out there and what we need to change. So the checklist helps us evaluate whether there's a hard surface at the front door of the bus stop. It takes uh, measurements of the boarding areas with the depth and the cross slope. It, uh, we're looking for surface condition that is firm and stable, not hazardous or in poor condition. We want to look for the required clear spaces free of obstacles. Um, we have a photo here on the slide that shows a bus stop that the boarding area is blocked by a light post, a trash can, and a bench. So some of those obstacles we can move and, and correct the situation. Um, and finally, we want to make sure the boarding area connects to the pedestrian route. So we did include this one page checklist in your information packet if you wanted to see those details. Next slide. Um, last year, Metro Transit completed a condition survey for our over 800 shelters at bus stops, and we flagged those shelters that had any of the um, bus stop accessibility issues that the, the checklist that I just mentioned would, would flag, and we um, flagged shelters where there, for one, is a full bench, so from sidewall to sidewall, so that bench is blocking um, that open floor area within the shelter. And we flagged shelters where the shelter itself is an obstacle through the pedestrian route. So in this slide, the top photo shows that full bench and the bottom slide shows a shelter that is um, partially in the sidewalk to the point where it's really become a, a barrier. Uh, next slide. So Trying to make progress on these goals, we're focusing our capital improvements and our capital budget on accessibility. We have that shelter condition survey, and so we've prioritized those that were flagged, those shelters that were flagged, to the next couple years. Let's make the either construction improvements or move the shelters, switch out the shelters to, to address those issues. Um, we're working on systematically prioritizing, you know, methods to systematically prioritize bus stops for constructing accessible boarding areas that those bus stops that are outside of our shelter program. And then our five year capital plan includes adding 120 shelters, replacing 150 shelters, and that would include site construction as needed for accessibility and constructing 150 um, accessible boarding areas. Another category of strategy is data improvements. We need that to track accessibility deficiencies and to standardize the information we collect when bus stop field inventories are taken. The checklist is helping us do that, and we're also working on some back-end database work as well so we can collect accurate, consistent data. And finally, we're using the newly created uh, design guide with our partner agencies to influence bus stop accessibility through roadway and development projects that Sonia is going to talk about now. Thank you. Thank you. Next slide, please. 
So hi everyone, my name is Sonia Berthas and I use she, her pronouns. I'm a planner in the Engineering and Facilities Department and I am currently working from home today. Um, I'm going to present on the regular route bus stop design guide, which is a tool to help Metro Transit and partners um, deliver transit service that links people, jobs, and community. And um, one thought that really underpinned the thinking of this guide is that a sustainable and accessible system really starts with the bus stop where many riders first access the Metro Transit system. So regular route here refers to local Metro Transit service, limited stop and express service for on-street Metro Transit bus stops, but it really excludes those big projects like BRT, LRT, and CRT, so bus rapid transit, um, light rail, and commuter rail. So Barry talked a little bit about our projects and programming, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about design. So the guide is recently posted on metrotransit.org for project staff, roadway authorities, and community members to reference online. And I'm hoping um, a link could potentially be included in the meeting minutes for everyone to review if they're interested. Um, but my aim is to highlight some key graphics and design principles in the guide and hear your suggestions and feedback. Next slide, please. So why is this guide needed? Um, we wanted to highlight this graphic and page of the guide that just shows the level of partnership with cities and roadway authorities that we need to design great bus stops. The graphic shows the layout of the space behind the curb at a bus stop, the bus stop sign, um, accessible boarding area at the front door, back door zones, and possible shelter locations are all labeled. The possible shelter locations ensure that the pedestrian access route is direct and doesn't jog around obstructions. And the clear zone, which is defined here as the space six feet back from the curb where transit riders get on and off the bus and where most street furniture should be avoid being placed except for specific transit amenities like a shelter, trees, street lights. And each bus stop really has its own unique context as folks who take transit know. And so the team siting or changing the bus stop zone should really consider, you know, how do people walking and rolling approach the stop? How does the bus driver navigate the roadway configuration and other vehicles to serve the stop? And how do riders um, waiting for the bus engage with that local context? I do expect this design guide to be updated in the future with new information and best practices as design continues to evolve. Next slide, please. Um, pages of the guide, bus stop position. The design guide includes information about bus stop position, which is how we describe where a bus stop is in relation to the intersection. So the bus stop um, position design guidance helps partners make sure that the bus doesn't block the crosswalk when serving the stop or legal crossing and will help bus stops be cited more consistently um, in relation to corners at the intersection. So this image shows a near side bus stop just before the intersection in the direction of travel, a far side bus stop just after the intersection in the direction of travel, and a mid block stop which is not near an intersection or located um, in a long space between traffic lights. So Metro Transit's categories also include an across from stop, which is at a T intersection. And across from stops can be either near side or far side. Next slide, please. Pages of the guide, bus stop zone design, accessible boarding area. Um, as folks here know, you know, accessible bus stops are really the building blocks of an accessible system. The accessible boarding area or ADA pad is that firm and stable surface at the front door um, which helps riders get on and off the bus and operators deploy the ramp for those using mobility or other wheeled devices. So this graphic just shows the accessible boarding area which is located immediately next to the bus stop sign and it is unobstructed and it's a firm, stable, and non-slip surface. So that's where operators are trained to, to stop and many riders um, are trained to wait. Next slide, please. So pages of the guide, bus stop zone design, clear zone. Here's another graphic showing the elements of the bus stop zone behind the curb. So the graphic shows the distances between 
the bus stop sign and the door zones. Um, this helps ensure that the door zones are unobstructed when cities and developers design the sidewalk or place streetscape amenities. It shows um, that front accessible boarding area at the front door and then the back door zone on both a 40 foot and 60 foot or articulated bus. And I just wanted to highlight, um, you know, for example, we don't necessarily control where the city or park board plants street trees, but this design guide can help make sure that trees or other street furniture don't block those door zones while still providing shade to riders. So, the, you know, there are many instances where during our formalized process of site plan review, you know, we've worked with the city of Minneapolis to make sure to get something like a raised planter bed out of the door zone into a better location. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, thank you, Chair and TAC members, for your time today. We have a few prompts for discussion. Um, you know, what are your, some of your experiences with bus stop accessibility? Are there bus stop accessibility topics you'd like to discuss in more detail with us in the future? Or are there other questions and comments? Thank you. Barry and Sonia, thank you very much. Um, that was a lot of great stuff. Uh, I see some hands. I will start with Patsy and then go to Daryl. No, that I guess with my hand, I did not take them. Oh. <laughs> However, That's, I do that. That is OK. There, it's like that. Thank um, you. Sorry, everyone. It's all good. Daryl, did you have a comment or question? That might have been a leftover hand too. I'm not sure. Sorry about that. I do have a comment and question. Um, I do. Hold on one second here. Sorry about that. If you want, Daryl, we can swing back around to you too. Um, I got a couple more hands up. It's up to you. Yeah. Um. No, I'm good. I'm good now. Okay. I, I was um when when you present this better. Better bus stop stop. It sounds good, right? And we do talk about what an a what an ADA pad looks like, what a accessible shelter looks like, what the path to that shelter may look like. But and we often forget about talking about the lighting and the heating elements. That those are often secondary or often left to last when we when we talk about new shelter designs when you talk about the fact of you may be or you're looking at reconstructing 150 new shelters shelter spots or stops are we looking at any of those new construction spots including a different type of heating element or a different type of of a glass element within the shelter space. I mean, so that that so that that glass, it, um, without the edging and without the cute little designs on them, would create that safety and that security feature that we often miss when we're putting shelters in these um in these neighborhoods that are considered low income or maybe challenging neighborhoods. Um, are we act, are we actually walking through those neighborhoods in in times of day that might be unsafe for for the reg, for us, but are we looking at connecting those shelters in appropriate spots with making sure that the safety and the security features that we think are built in when we look at those designs, are we making sure that we're elevating those to the top so that those shelters can be successful spots and those could be uh, high frequent high frequent use spots from time to time if we did it right from the beginning? I, that was a lot. I said a lot. 
and I don't know if you guys caught the juice of it, but it, it wasn't necessary to hammer the lighting and the heating element, but it was to encompass the whole safety and security lighting and heating all together. Thank you, um, Chair and members of the committee. Uh, that's well said. And um, first, I just wanted to touch on the heat element. Uh, I've heard you talk about that in the past and open our eyes to the fact that a, a heating element that we place up high does not work well if you're sitting lower. So that's something our department has discussed. We have not found a solution or taken action on that. I appreciate you bringing it back up. Um, you're, ne you're never going to take an action item on it unless we actually do something intentionally different than what we've been doing in the past. So we actually got to say, hey, yes, we want to protect our heating elements. Yes, we don't want anybody to get hurt. Yes, we don't want to replace them when they get damaged. But if we continue to do it the same way we've been doing it, yes, we're never going to find a, a good solution to it. We're never going to find an alternative to it. Thank you. I, I I guess I mean to say we're working on it. I don't have progress to share today. The other items you mentioned, I wanted about safety, security, and taking in that bigger context. I want to let you know that all our shelter purchases going forward and new glass that we're purchasing will be clear. We're not going to continue to buy and install the glass that has the patterning on it, whether striped or the pattern, the the maze they call it. Yes. So um, we've heard that that is um, there's a lot of reasons for that decision. One of them being safety, security, visibility, making sure the bus operator can see you, um, and so people can see in and out of the shelter. Thank you. Um, you're welcome. Um, that. Um, other topic, um, lighting, uh, and just how we decide to place that involves trying to look for documented cases of security concerns. And like you said, walking the system and understanding the system is, is important to know. Um, uh, like there are shelters where we've added light because of uh rider concerns about safety and um, we use our metro transit police data to help understand what's going on and prioritize those electrical connections and i saw that you had your hand up but took it down um did did you not want to ask a, a question or make a comment anymore now you're talking up. Who are you talking about? Now it's back up, Ken. I just okay. I wanted to ask Ken to see if he had a question. Do you have a question, Ken? I got thumbs up. All right, hands down, thumbs up. Okay, I will go to Trevor and then Eric and then Heidi. I see your hands up. So take it away, Trevor. Absolutely. Hi, um, this is Trevor speaking. Um, thanks for their presentation. It's really um, good to see that they're in the Metro Council doing a lot to improve the bus stop the back door is blocked by the bus shelter and i've had situations where i'd gotten off and the bus driver didn't know didn't notice that i am still in between the shelter and the bus and takes off mm -hmm. and you know i unfortunately and I'm, I'm a low vision person but unfortunately i have enough vision that i can kind of figure it out but for people who have lower vision, that can be really disorienting. And, you know, I can see a situation where you almost become grated like cheese between the bus and the shelter. Um, it, I mean, it's kind of scary, to be honest. Um, so I was, I'm just kind of, first of all, I'm just kind of curious why, what was the reasoning for bus shelter being placed like that? Um, and then and I saw, actually, there was an example of that. Your very first slide had a shelter that, had that kind of situation and then on your diagram of the option the placement of the shelter i think it was option two and three or something like that and that's the kind of the situation i'm talking about i mean i know technically the the doors are supposed to line up you know between the or you know the shelter supposed to line up between the doors but i just i found in my situation where the bus driver, bus driver pulled up a little too far and he's so focused on getting people on and paying and all that kind of stuff they're not noticing on the back you know 
Um, so yeah, I was just kind of curious about that. Thank you, Trevor. I, um, maybe I'll just take a quick stab at this and if Barry has anything to add, she can. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm so sorry that you had that experience. That sounds really um, kind of frightening and terrible. And as Barry mentioned, we want to make sure that our transit amenities, specifically shelters, are not adding an, any additional barriers or any safety concerns to the bus stop. Um, I think you're right that um, we do attempt to place it sometimes between the front and rear door, specifically on a 40-foot bus, because there is enough space um, if we both get the installation right and if um, an operator is able to stop right at the bus stop sign. But also acknowledging that it's a dynamic streetscape environment, so there might be things like a parked car that could be in the bus stop zone, making it shorter or um, other obstruction. So um, that's really good feedback, and I think um, part of the answer could be making sure that it's a smaller shelter um, and then getting that installation uh, more precisely. One reason we kept that space as a possibility is because when the um, when the city or the county or other roadway authority provides that pedestrian network, sometimes it can be so narrow um, that the pedestrian access route, which we want to not create a jog or make sure that it's straight and direct, it's only um, up against the building face. So if we were to flip the um, and I know this is kind of hard just to describe without um, seeing something or being out in the field, but if we were to flip the shelter, that could um, then impede the pedestrian access route. So sometimes it's a trade-off between keeping that straight and providing a shelter or not providing a shelter or some other solution, perhaps moving the bus stop. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, just, I know a lot of it could just be training on the driver's part, you know, making sure that they stop. I mean, and I know like it, it, after a long day, they're tired, you know, they don't necessarily, you know, they're trying to stop the bus or whatever, but just making sure that, always making sure that that back door is clear because, you know, if you're having people coming on and off, especially now that with the pandemic where they're asking you to get, go out the back door, um, just making sure that back door is clear and also making sure that people are clear from the <laughs> back door before taking off. So, Yeah, that, that's another great point. And I will pass that along that um, to our street operations team, just that uh, to keep an eye on that back door and continue that training. I'm sure that they do. And ever really quickly, I just want to say, um, remember the front bus part two, because where you park, I had the, in the, when it was a real bad pandemic and we couldn't really use the buses a lot. He made it for the back, but then the front wasn't handicapped accessible for me because he parked right between the two buses. So Trevor doesn't get what he wants and then I don't get what I want. So how do we come up with both? Because he's right on about there is a problem on both ends. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi that and makes Trevor. Sense to you. Thank you, Heidi and Trevor. I have Eric, and then I'll go to Richard, and then I'll go to you, John, okay? I'm try trying to keep the order of folks as best as possible. Um, no, take, take it away, Eric. All right, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, my only question is, you had mentioned you were performing inspections and doing inventorizing the, the field conditions for these bus stops. And when you were doing the inspections, I assume, obviously, for accessibility as well, but were your inspections, um, were they compared to the inspections that were performed with the ADA transition plan and through JQP's inspections? And if so, was there pretty much 100% agreeance on all of the barriers that may have been found? Um, chair, members of the committee, the um, shelters we inspected that I was referring to in bus stops, that's a different set of places than what JQP did, so there was no overlap. That's an interesting question, though. Would would we get the same results? But it was it was a different group of transit stops. So I guess a follow up to that. So the ADA transition plan didn't look at the bus stops for the transit? 
chair, committee members, this is Guthrie. I can answer that question. So, Eric, uh, and I probably should have clarified this at the outset. So, with the 140 or so facilities that were uh, evaluated, all uh, facility connected bus stops were evaluated at that time, given just the the number of bus stops under our purview, the 12,000 or so bus stops. So, it was just a massive undertaking. So, I think that the reports and the findings uh, related to those bus stops definitely inform the accessibility of our bus stops going forward. So like that checklist was definitely informed by JQP's input. Uh, so going forward as we work to inventory all of our bus stops and where we're at with the accessibility of those bus stops, it's, it is in uniformity with how JQP had um, uh, evaluated our bus stops that were connected to those facilities at that time. All right, thank you. Richard, your turn. Sure, thank you, David. Uh, one just comment I have is that in terms of making bus stops, better bus stops, distance between bus stops is also an issue of accessibility. And I just raised that because I didn't see that there's a specific guideline as far as distance between bus stops. But just raising that issue. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair, members in the committee, and Richard. Um, as I understand, um, service development has some guidelines in the Appendix G portion of the Transportation Policy Plan um, adopted for 2040. And so I think there are some distance between bus stops and also distance between routes standards there. Um, so I. I focused in this guide on um, very much at the site level, at the bus stop site level, but um, that is also great feedback that I'm happy to pass on. Thank you. Thanks. Awesome, Richard. John, go ahead, and then we'll end with Daryl, the last hand that I see before we move on to the next agenda item. Yeah, I, I just find myself quite concerned about uh, Trevor's uh, experience and the, the real danger that poses. I just wondered what percentage of bus shelters are abutting the street, if you have that statistic, not. Um, members of the committee, Chair John, that's a good question that I cannot answer at my fingertip. I think I could look it up though to get an estimate because that was part of our um, survey was the orientation of the shelter. And I do want to bring that case back to um, our department on the design side. And as Sonia mentioned, bringing it back to the group that does bus operator training. So often that is the, um, you know, considered a good place to put a shelter when the space is tight, when there's available space behind the sidewalk is really where we want to be. Often that's private property and we can't get permission to put the shelter there. Um, but this is um, this is good feedback for us to bring back. And just that the the focus on whenever possible uh, to to not put it abutting the street. Um, I don't know. Thank you. Go ahead, Daryl. You may be muted. I can't hear you. Out of the sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Out of the 12,000 or so bus stops that you didn't look at, how many bus stops um, do we actually have that are attached to facilities that you didn't look at? And and did we look at any of updating or changing any of those in reference to making this bus stop accessibility checklist, which only has like 10 questions on it, um, and I'm not sure that, you, I mean, I would assume that Metro Transit and my council has their own accessibility checklist. 
and I would assume that it's a lot more extensive than just these 10 questions. How did these 10 questions get to be the short list of accessibility? And why aren't there some other questions on that, on that checklist as well? Chair, members of the committee, and Daryl, the, um, the checklist is only getting at that bus stop environment where it's on the street, there's a signpost, there, and um, no shelter, no transit center or park and ride. It's very simplified to that most basic bus stop, if that makes sense. And the so, question... Those, those are the bus stops that I like to use the most, and those are the most inaccessible bus stops, um, especially during intimate weather and uh, weather changes. Understood. Um, yes, those are the most common type of bus stop in our system. So the checklist does not get at the things that um, JQP inventoried through the ADA transition plan. Um, and, and it does not include the, the data that was collected for our shelter inventory. So do we have to call them back to do another, another, um, another list of our inventory specifically to those, those bus shelters that we, um, most typically think of when we look at our system? I mean, when you tell me that there's 12,000 bus stops, but yeah, you've only looked at maybe how many of them, 150 of them that are attached to the facilities of facilities maintenance, or maybe there's even more. I think there's approximately what, 300 of them, even if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, my, I'm getting closer, right? You are. Yeah. Let me clarify my numbers. I apologize. We've got our 12,000 or so bus stops and we've got 850 or so um on street shelters and those okay. have been inventoried and ev evaluated for accessibility um we have our park and rides and our transit centers those have been evaluated for accessibility it's those the bus stops that you described as the ones you like to use and the ones that are most common that are needing to be evaluated right because that five by five little pad that you show me on an accessible pad I mean, even though that is considered ADA accessible, accessible, that does not um, meet the average travelers, the average transit users' way of the of how they use that pad or how they access that pad. So, I mean, to to put those in and to show that as as an as a replacement pad or as something that you're replacing within the system. I mean, I think I think we could do better. We could do better. That's good feedback. All right, thank you, Daryl. Thank you, um, Sonia, and thank you, Barry, very much. Uh, we have one last presentation on transit-oriented development. Um, so yeah, just uh, take it away, please. Take it away, Lucy, if you are on the line. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm here and I hope you can hear me. Uh, my name is Lucy Galbraith. Uh, I am a pale female and multi-ethnic. I use the pronouns a she and her. And uh, my field is transit-oriented development, which is kind of the, um, trying to create sustainable, equitable communities supported by transit. And it's, uh, I call it the most intersectional field because it really does combine everything. And so next slide, please. Uh, I started this by thinking, what would a TOD neighborhood look like? And many of us have seen these neighborhoods because many of our um, favorite neighborhoods in our cities were transit-oriented development neighborhoods because they were the streetcar neighborhoods that were built about a hundred years ago. 
And so, you know, they had sidewalks, they had corner stores. You can walk down the old streetcar routes and tell where the stops used to be because you will find corner stores where the stops used to be. So if we were trying to uh, build the modern version of those, what would we see? And so, um, you know, at transit trips, you don't go from the front door of your home to the place you want to go, whether it's the store or the job or the doctor's office, there's everything in between. So what, what a transit oriented neighborhood needs to look like, it needs to have the right infrastructure. It needs safe streets for all users. And that means among other things, as I think some of you have already discussed, appropriate sidewalks that are wide enough and smooth enough. It needs protected bikeways so that the bikes aren't in front of the cars or getting onto the sidewalks. And it needs for cars to be accommodated, but not prioritized. You know, they have highways where the cars, it's their very own space, but in, in neighborhoods, they need not to be their very own space everywhere. So, and it means at intersections that the intersection again is kind of designed with people first, that we need generally shorter crossing distances than we do at kind of highway places. And uh, we need to generally lengthen crossing times that the, the standards in many places, the crossing time is to uh, prioritize the car trip uh, time and not kind of everybody's comfort level with being able to cross. And, you know, uh, people have different crossing uh, times for different reasons. And it's not always people looking at their phone. Sometimes you have a stroller or you need a cane or whatever. So the crossing time needs to accommodate the, the users in our neighborhoods. And then there's some regulatory stuff. The 20 is plenty uh, movement, which is really global, it's not just in this country, uh, is is to is both a safety thing in that if, heaven forbid, you get hit by a car going 20, you're probably going to survive. And the higher the speed, both the, the greater the likelihood of a car crash and the greater the damage and the, the risk to the person who is hit. So 20 is plenty is both the safety thing and then it's just uh, drivers who are going 20 are much more likely to see and be able to stop. And then the last regulatory thing that makes a really huge difference is to not have right turns on red in urban neighborhoods because the driver who is thinking about turning right is looking left to look out for the car that's coming from the left. And they're not looking to the right to the pedestrian who might be in that crosswalk and who might well have the right of way from a green light. So that's the kind of example. And this slide, I had to condense it for things that I could talk forever about. But these are the kinds of things that thinking about that space between the, the time you leave, you know, from one door to the to getting to the transit, all the little pieces that make it um, comfortable as well as safe for people. So next slide. Lucy, so I, I want to, yes? this is David, I want to chime in real quickly because I, I realized that I did not introduce this agenda item the way that I wanted to. Oh, so okay. TAC members, what, um, I, I, I mentioned this a couple months ago, but what we want to start doing is um, have, and which is what this is, is uh, d different department introductions to you. So both the department in Metro Transit or the Met Council uh, is familiar with us and we are familiar with them as well. Um, so that is what this is. This is not like project specific. This is, this is department specific information. Um, and I apologize for not telling you that at the beginning of the, at the beginning of the presentation. So Lucy, continue please. Okay, thank you. And I probably should have given more overview. The Tr Transit Oriented Development Office started in 2014. Uh, I arrived here from Austin, Texas, where I started their TOD office. But I've been doing this kind of urbanism. I usually say I'm a practicing urbanist. And what I do is love cities, is trying to make cities better for everybody. And um, until COVID, I got to walk to work. But Anyway, so I wanted to give just one simple kind of example of how um, thinking about the connection, these connections between development and the transit can, can make all the difference in the world in the accessibility to transit. So this is a diagram. 
uh, and it ha does have alt text on the slide. I don't know if that's going to be popped up, but it shows a, a little bus going along on a street across the top of this diagram. And then it, it, there is a, uh, an apartment building that's on a cul-de-sac that comes off a parallel street uh, that on the diagram is at the bottom. So the bus would have to turn right, go down to the parallel street, go over, go up into the cul-de-sac, stop and at the bus stop, and then go down the cul-de-sac and back over to the connecting street, up to the top street, the original parallel street, and then go on its way. And that's a really large delay. And if there's anybody who's originally on the bus, then, then they're not going to be happy about this. And it's not going to be efficient because no single apartment building is going to have enough bus riders. So next slide. And this is the kind of thing that if you have this connect the people to the transit lens, you could add uh, a, a, a sidewalk, a pedestrian way, from the top of the cul-de-sac up to the main street and put the bus stop there. So then the bus can stay on the main street, stop at the end of this connecting sidewalk. The people in the apartment building, assuming there's a sidewalk built at the edge of the cul-de-sac, can walk to the bus stop and have a very efficient ride and be more likely to ride. It's, it's a better route for them and a better route for everybody on this bus ride. So this is a very simple example, but it, it tends to fall between the two stools because it's like it's on private property. So it takes the collaboration of the apartment building and whoever owns that little piece of land and the transit agency and the city and everybody, but it's a simple thing that connects people to to the transit. So sometimes I talk about development-oriented transit as well as transit-oriented development. But this is this is the lens and the kind of thing TOD office. Besides trying to get development out of the ground on property we own, we try to work with all our partners, including my friends Sonia and Barry, to think about these solutions that uh, take more process in the front end, but that really connect people to places they want to go. So next slide. And over the last three years, uh, I worked with a group at the American Public Transit Association uh, to, to develop transit universal design guidelines. And the group was led by the chief architect at BART, uh, who's my friend and, in my opinion, a genius. Uh, Tian Feng, whose passion is making transit uh, welcoming to everybody. As he says, it shouldn't just meet ADA, it should be welcoming and comfortable for everyone. So uh, I was privileged to get to be on that committee. I, I'm not sure other than an interest in the subject why I was there, but I'm glad I was. Anyway, so this was issued last um, in August of 2020, and, and it, it starts kind of at the higher level to help people like Barry and Sonia and everybody else to kind of have a, a framework of thinking more than kind of a here's the, you, you know, they've developed a here's how big the pad has to be. And this is more of a, of a guidelines, kind of the big picture, how to think about this. So these are the goals, the big goals of universal design that body fit, that whatever you design should accommodate a wide range of sizes and abilities. And then comfort, that whatever we demand in terms of the user should be within the limits of both uh, function and perception. It should be easy for the user to kind of figure out what to do and how to do it. And then awareness that we should ensure critical information for use is easily perceived that, that people shouldn't have to work to figure out where to put the money in or whatever it is. And then awareness to ensure that the critical information is easily perceived. Again, kind of as we walk, walk through this to think about it from the user lens and do whatever we can as the designers and the builders to to, um, to do our best. These are our goals. <laughs> They're not, again, you know, kind of, this doesn't tell you how to design it. It tells you what to think about as you're doing it. And then understanding to make how to use things uh, as intuitive as we can. And um, 
then wellness is we sh and this of course is counts a lot now wellness has at least three components and one is to promote health one is to prevent disease and one is to um, prevent injury so these are all things to kind of look at as we go through this process and you know i was thinking of that with what trevor said is kind of okay what else could we do here in terms of um, moving the shelter or moving the where the bus stops or moving the parking space or whatever happens there that this is part of the framework and social integration is to treat all groups of people with dignity and respect and personalization if we can to make it possible for people to personalize their experience and I think this comes up a lot of times with the applications that if people are always going to want to use one option then they should be able to pro you know to kind of pick it so that they don't always have to go through three choices to get to the one that they're always going to want to use and that's just a small example but if we have this lens maybe we can do that and cultural appropriateness uh, to respect and reinforce the cultural values in the social and economic and environmental context of any design project and that's very broad and very sweeping and can mean a lot of different things but to me it always means um, uh, engaging and really listening to uh, the people of the community where you are um, I was privileged to work with uh, Jennifer McVale in Austin a lot and some of you may know of her uh, she taught me a lot <laughs> and one of the slogans she used I just I carry with me it's like nothing about us without us and uh, she and I worked on a project that ended up making a lot of pieces of downtown more accessible so um, uh, I'm very grateful to her for all that I learned uh, she's kind of a hero actually anyway so next slide so I just have a couple of pictures here of examples that are in this 53 page transit universal design guide but this is a picture in Colum uh, Colombia um, I don't think we spelled the country right but that's probably me making that mistake or spell check anyway to show that leaning rails which are in a lot of places that it's it's really easy to make the leaning rails at multiple heights so that different people can use them and you know they're meant for places where nobody's going to be there long and they are comfortable for some people and not all uh, but it, 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 all too often they come in one size and anytime it's one size fits all we're not really thinking um, broadly enough so next slide and this is uh, an example in Amsterdam in their central station where they have a bikeway going through and a large pedestrian way going through and it, this is not meant to be kind of we should do it exactly like this but I like this example because of the care they took to make sure that everything is safe and comfortable and appropriately lit for the different kinds of users that they have in this shared space and so that you know the difference in textures the difference in lighting the difference in kind of pavements and all that 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 many many people can go through this space and experience it um, comfortably and and not get lost and not feel overwhelmed by you know where do I get off or any of those things so next slide I could go on in infinite detail pretty much forever for a, a long time but I wanted to leave a lot of room for questions and I can talk about any of the things I've mentioned or about any well it's not that I'm an expert on all this but I've been do, working on trying to create um, community supported by transit for a long time oh I did want to mention one more thing before I close really quickly that some of us at Metro Transit are just starting at the very beginning of trying a new approach to transit planning by compiling data on essential services like um, uh, health clinics and groceries and pharmacies and banking uh, to, to put together these these essential services and then map them along a potential route and then look at how many people can access these for different stop possible stop locations and you know do the various iterations of breaking down different groups of you know so we can do accessibility 
by different um, income groups or ability groups or whatever, but just trying to take this lens because traditionally um, transit has been planned by uh, jobs and housing, by population and jobs, and by only a few metrics of kind of how many people can access this. But our incredible people who know a lot about GIS and data can now look at many more things at once. So we're just at the beginning of that. So if you ask me questions, I probably don't know much, but I just wanted to say that I'm very excited that we're exploring that because if COVID had any value for us, we learned both who the essential workers are and we learned where the essential destinations were. And so we want to start using that more. So with that, I'll close and I'll be happy to take any questions. And thank you for having me. Thank you. Can I say something? Of this course, Heidi. Heidi, hold on one second. Thank you very much, Lucy. And you you almost spelled Medellin right. You just missed the accent mark over the eye, but yes. Medellin, Colombia is the, is the place. Um, I'll start with Heidi and then I saw John's hand. Go ahead, Heidi, and then we'll go to John. Uh I'm glad you brought this, David, to our table. This is kind of the stuff that I talk about a lot about processing. How do you get to the bus stop to, you know, from my house to the bus stop to wherever I need to go? Do you, do you have anybody on your committee working with you that have disabilities and processing problems, but is, you know, can help you guys guide this even further, even around the world and stuff? Because I'm always talking about it's not just having it all ADA and handicapped accessible, but I also have to process how to get there. So if I have th three options, which are great, can I use all three options and understand all three options? Or do I always have to use one because that's the only one my disability and my brain understands? Have you ever looked into people who have processing problems that have to use the city buses and the trains for the rest of their lives? They have no choice. And part of their disability is not just physical, but the <laughs> brain part. So I wanted to ask you if you ever looked into that, because I think you uh, are, this is a great concept. I like what you're talking about, like everything about it. Just how do we further it? Thank you. Um, thank you for the question. Uh, and uh, the short answer is yes, one of the people involved in this effort does have some um, processing disabilities, but as just, and I, I want to emphasize that as part of selecting both the destinations and at every step of this process, I've kind of emphasized to the project managers that we need to be sure that we are inclusive in checking. Are these the right destinations? Is this the right, you know, that we check. Here's what we think we found. Here's what we think the path is. So, uh, uh, I've already put, Guthrie's ears should be burning. I've already put his name on several lists to, to make sure that we check in. And um, we're pretty far away from having kind of the kind of here's the path or here are the alternative paths. But I will make sure that, that this committee and you specifically are consulted before a final decision is made. Because Thank you. I because sometimes you. we get lost you know we we designed something beautiful but if i can't get there and you can't even explain it to get me out the door then we got a problem i first got to be able to get out the door to order to do it so yeah. i would love to help your projects down the line if you ever need us thank you i appreciate that so i see this is david i see three hands raised um we got about eight minutes left in this meeting and we have some more business to do i will go to the two hands that i see now because one was dropped down um i'll start with richard and then go to eric uh, uh oh john that's right i wanted to come to you first john go ahead john okay. sorry about that. um just i suppose this is really quick but um what are the forces in minnesota in terms of you know we're such a auto and uh, highway oriented society and i just happened to read an article in the nation about uh, the power of the, the highway lobby down there just to build and build and build and, and, and up, we end up without 
uh, communities that we could walk or wheel to. And just any thoughts you have about the broader kind of political economic forces that you feel free to, to, uh, to address. But I'm really interested in talking to you about that. Well, I'll have to pick my words carefully because okay. I am employed by the Met Council. But yes. the research that has been done is very clear that um, highway culture, highway oriented, that spending more dollars on highways uh, does not increase uh, economic efficiency, does not relieve congestion, and does negatively impact air quality. And there's a, there's a lot of factual research that the um, uh, whatever we think about what has been done in the past, the investment for the future uh, in almost in general, you know, I don't want to speak about any specific project, but in general, investing in highways at this point in time, uh, the numbers don't run. So I will stop there because you're right. There's a lot out there. <laughs> and yes. It's hard for me to stop. Uh, Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Richard, take it away, and then Eric. All right. Thank you. This is a very interesting presentation. I just wanted to put in a plug in case you haven't been in touch with them. The Governor's Council on an Age-Friendly Minnesota, which was just uh, reauthorized by the legislature in the past legislative session. And transit is an important part of what they, they hope to deal with. I think that's one that I was at one point asked to be part of, and I just don't have the bandwidth. You know, I sent them what I could, but I don't have the bandwidth to add something more. All right, go ahead, Eric, and then we'll move on to the rest of the yeah, Thank you, Mr. Chair. I apologize if I missed this, but I just was hoping to get clarification on exactly what Todd is for the transit-oriented development. Because when I look at, I understand universal design, but what is this? A, is this a committee? Is this a department within Metro Transit? Because a lot of the things that Todd would like to accomplish seem to be based around policy that I don't think Met Council necessarily said. So, like slow traffic, twenty is plenty, is something cities. Um, typically implement safe streets for all users. That's again, something typically cities approve through a subdivision process when they're building streets or their standards and the like. So I'm wondering if it's not what Todd is or what, I guess it might be what authority Todd has within Met Council or the, uh, the Metro Transit, just so I can get an understanding. I think the whole committee here can get an understanding. Um, That's an excellent question. The TOD office, uh, we try to implement the, T the council's TOD policy, and it's not a Metro Transit <coughs> policy, it's the council policy. They want us to maximize the uh, development impact of transit investments. So we have done some development on our property, like the, the uh, soccer stadium uh, on Snelling and University. Most of it sits on uh, council property, and they pay us an annual rent of a little over half a million while they're there. So, you know, we we hope that more development happens around that. We do we work with all the cities a lot to help them get TOD out of the ground. We've applied for a grant to help get the 38th Street station development out of the ground um, to build the appropriate street infrastructure there and to help make it safer for pedestrians and things. So we do a lot of bits and pieces to uh, work with our partner cities and counties to get development that's walkable uh, to transit. And we work internally to help every piece of the council to have more of this TOD lens. We've worked with the city of Minneapolis on reducing parking ratios and things like that. So there, there's a, and it's kind of an anything we can do and any support we can give to any of our partners. Uh, we try to do what we can with um, more people connected to jobs. So we work with a lot of the economic development entities to, to, to say, here, transit is good for jobs and good for attracting employers. 
We put out an annual report on the development trends along transit. That most recent one said that in the nine years from 2009 to 2018, uh, more than 40% of all the multifamily units in the region were built along high frequency transit, which is less than 3% of the land. So clearly developers see that people want transit. And that's, that's kind of a big win for transit. It's a big win for climate and other things. And then generally we support a 21st century transportation system and generally we advance equity. We try to get affordable housing along transit. And I will stop because as you can tell, I could, I, yeah, yeah. So oh, I, I appreciate is, that clarification. Um, and you know, so and, I, would, I would take it that you also probably look at comp plans and, and have. Um, we do a, a plan request. That, yeah, yeah. Barry and, and her office, uh, they review the comp plans to be sure that the transit stop is fixed. What we tend to do is, is have more conversation at the city policy level and um, I'm kind of involved in a lot of national things. Uh, have been it's because I've, I'm kind of old. I've been involved in a lot of things for a long time, so I tend to be available to say how other places have struggled with things, and I can tap into my network to try to answer questions and things. But but yes, yes, we we talk at at the comp plan level in the county and city level. I'll, a lot of it upon request because again another piece of the council is the regulatory level and we're advisory so i like being advisory and not regulatory so i hope that answers your question and was it too much thank you very much lucy and that was a, a great question eric um yes. we have all of one minute left um let's do the subcommittee report ken do you have uh anything for the blue line to update us on And I am okay if the answer is no. Chris, uh, if you are here, do you have anything to update us on with the green line? And then Daryl, gold and rush line, do you have any updates for us? Can I, can I give my reports next month? Sounds good. That's actually nice for our timing today. Um, did anybody um, on the bus priority seating tech work group want to chat about what they're working on? Uh, it's not necessary, but I want to give you an opportunity to update us. Alrighty. Um, I don't have much of a report. I did want to let you all know, though, since I'm sure everybody is dying. Are we going to, Daryl, I mean, um, what? Are we going to talk about the um, our committee we were on, David? You know where we we got not, together. Not quite yet. We'll, okay, thank we'll, you. We'll, we'll add that to add, to add that to the agenda after maybe one one or two more. One meetings. or two just, more. Okay. Yeah, yeah. just because we you. really we just got it kicked off last time, and we don't have any time. Um, um, chair's report. Just thirty seconds. Just wanted to let you all. I'm, I'm sure all of you are 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 um, burning to know, uh, dying to know why we don't have the the uh, State Fair update this month. Um, frankly, we just couldn't fit it into people's schedules, um, but we did want to have it, and I apologize that we don't have an update uh, to you all, because I know that it's going to be a different year this year. Um, but if we can get something sent out via email, we will. Uh, is there anybody from the public who would like to comment right now? And I do see that folks are, are leaving at 2.30, which is okay. If you have to leave, please leave. Um, um, I will not hold it against you. And member comment. Are there any members of the committee who would like to make a comment now? David, this is Jeff Daines. Um, so we're going to continue with the WebEx meeting for the yes. foreseeable future. Yeah, it's very much touch and go at this point, as I'm sure you all can understand. Um, we thought we were out of it, but I guess we're not. It's given, you know, we both just had Minneapolis and St. Paul mask mandates, and I think Ramsey County did it as well. I, I'm sure Hennepin did or will do it. But um, yeah, we will be uh, doing remote 
a, you know, month to month basis is I think the best that we can, we can give you now, but I would say that we'll be doing remote for at least the next few months. Um, any other members? Thank go ahead. You. Go ahead. Yeah, and also road construction. I was thinking about how do we get downtown. Some of us can and some of us can't because it's getting to the point where you can't even take a bus sometimes because you have to relearn the new location of the bus stops, you know, or the relocation of th that bus stop to get to the train. So I'm kind of glad we're doing it over WebEx right now because we got so much going on and the scariness of the stuckness. The two don't go hand in hand very well. So I I, I applaud Dave for um, thinking wisely because um, we need someone to, to put their foot down and say, let's be safe and not play it stupid. Thank you. Well, I wish I could take credit for that, but I am definitely in no position to determine <laughs> the Met Council's meetings, um, whether they're going to well, be in you person. Are thinking but I appreciate about it. <laughs> you are thinking about us, and that's what matters. We need somebody to, you know, to say, "Hey, enough is enough," and just let's be safe about it. At the same Nothing. time, we can talk about what we, what we believe in by over these meetings. Yeah, and nothing will change without plenty of notice to all of you. Um, do any of the members have comments? Otherwise, we can finish. Only four minutes over. Thought we were gonna go over more. Um, thank you all very much. We do have a meeting scheduled for September, so we will see you all in exactly one month. Um, have a good rest of your week. Bye, everybody. Have a good week. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much.